Okay, welcome to our next talk for the Java User Group Switzerland. Today we have uh, Thomas here. We, he will talk about mob programming and how to build teams and keeping teams together. A very interesting topic and I'm looking forward to hear more of it. But first, you know it, some administrative information. And first, a huge thank to our sponsors. Without our sponsors, it would not be possible to do all these talks. So give them a visit, maybe. <laughs> oh, and I see some of you are writing in the chat where you are from, that's great. The chat, of course, is for you. So just use it, just write down there, whatever you want, talk, whatever. If you have a question for Thomas, then please switch to the Q&A tab. It's next to the chat, top right side. And uh, if you ask your question there, then others can vote on your question. So please don't wait with a question until the end of the talk. Enter it in as fast as possible. So when you know your question, when you have a question, enter it so others can vote on it. And uh, we are collecting the questions today and will answer them at the end of the talk. We have a delay of 10 to 15 seconds to optimize the stream as usual. So uh, there may be some awkward silence uh, when we are waiting for some answers because we have a poll, but that's uh, usual. We have a feedback form, you know this already if you are a regular visitor of the Java user group. But today there is a change. Today we don't forward you to the feedback form. You will get the feedback form later via email and please give us feedback. It's very important for the speaker and for us and where we can improve and what is okay, what is not okay, very important for us. And we don't forward you at the end to the feedback form because we will forward you to a tool called WonderMe where we can meet after the talk if you want. So. You know, usually we have some uh, networking with Apero uh, after the talks. Now we have the virtual version of it where we can come together and talk about different topics. So everyone can talk there. Microphone is enabled, webcam is enabled. So we can meet there. Thomas will be there too. And we can just talk. Okay, so that's it with my administrative information. <laughs> And uh, now I will hand over to Thomas. And but we let's have some, with some polls first, right? Some questions. Let's check the first questions. Do you want to read the first question? Yeah, I'd like to know from you. Hello and good evening. <laughs> First of all, uh, I'd like to know from you who's currently working remote and who's currently working on site. And maybe you're working as well remote as well as on site that I get an idea if you're more interested into more programming or remote more programming. Yeah. And of course, you can uh, check both if you are working a few days on site, a few days remote. Yes. It's the same for the second poll. And there are coming the answers pretty much remote. <laughs> yeah, nobody working on site so far. Oh, one, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... No wonder these days. <laughs> yes. Forty-two or forty-five, forty-three. Perfect. Let's continue with the second question. Yeah, thank you. So next uh, and the last question, I'd like to know who's already using maybe pair programming or mob programming uh, for working together or similar methods like pull requests and code reviews, um, or if you use none of uh, these practices. A lot of code reviews, um, as well as uh, pull requests. A quarter uh, is doing pair programming and only 5%, 6% mob programming. That's great because uh, you learn lots of new things today. Okay. 
Okay, that looks good. 43 responses. So about everybody send us an answer. That's absolutely great. Thank you. Okay, now I will hand over to Thomas for his talk. Are you ready? Yeah, okay. Let's start Good with the screen, screen sharing. Okay, there we are. So, welcome and good evening, everybody. Um, it's great to be back again at Java User Group Switzerland. I think it's only been four months uh, since I presented Arcunet to you. And today I'd like to talk about mob programming and remote mob programming and how these techniques, uh, how these practices help us to build teams and to keep existing teams stay together. My name is Thomas Much. I'm a software developer freelancer from Hamburg and I'm a software developer working mainly in the Java stack and I'm an agile developer coach as well. That is, I'm uh, using uh, agile programming practices like test-driven development, um, refactorings, clean code, continuous integration and pair programming. And I'd like to help teams getting better at, at these practices. And uh, it must have been uh, 2016 when I met uh, my first team that was brave enough to try mob programming with me. And it's been mind blowing from the start. Um, that's why I wanna talk to you about this topic today. And at the beginning of last year, just a few months before the pandemic, just a few weeks before the lockdown, um, I was coaching a team, a distributed team, and we tried remote mob programming together. Um, I did not invent these practices, so I'm standing off the shoulders of giants here. And these giants have published several books on the topic, uh, on the topics of mob programming and remote mob programming. Um, I've uh, uh, assembled a collection of links to those books at the end of the slides and to other resources as well. You get the slides after the talk, so have a look at them. They're really great, they're really helpful. Um, more and more coaches and managers uh, realize the huge possibilities of mob programming, like the most important improvement I've seen in the last couple of years, or it's one of the most significant improvements that a team can adopt. Wow. So how and where did uh, mob programming emerge? Let's go back to the, uh, to the beginnings of the Agile movement. You probably know about um, Scrum, uh, extreme programming, Kanban, pragmatic programming, and software craft. And these methods must be, to be successful, must be complemented by technical programming practices like pair programming, uh, refactoring, continuous integration. I mentioned these already. Um, problem is, uh, these practices are 20 years old. And the question is, are these still valid practices for modern software development of the 2020s? The short answer is um, they probably are still useful, but we have to evolve them and we have to complement them with new practices um, that help us with the new challenges that we face uh, every day. And that's where mob programming enters the scene. About 10 years ago, Woody Zuell was helping a team and a company to get back on track with their software development. They were exploring new ways of working together. And the result was what we know as mob programming today. And they must have done something right, something different than before. Because when mob programming was presented at an agile conference in 2014, it just took off. And older ideas like pair programming with more than two from 2003, they just vanished. So mob programming must have done something right. Why the name? Uh, if I get it right, um, Woody was coaching a team who called themselves the mob. So it was mob programming. Um, had they called themselves uh, the elephants or the lemmings, maybe we, t we would call it uh, elephant programming or lemming programming today. Anyway, finding good names is hard. And mob programming is sometimes referred to as mobbing. And that's a pretty negative connotation in many languages because it means bullying. So many people around the world are looking for better names like group programming or team programming. 
but they're not as catchy as mob programming. The latest edition is ensemble programming, which I really like a lot, but please don't think of it as a large orchestra playing exactly note by note, but more of a small band um, making music together, having lots of fun and creating a smash hit. This way uh, it's fun and it's really great to work this way together. And the idea of how we are working together is to, to gather all the people that we need, not just the developers and maybe the ops people, but also the quality specialists and all the product people. Yes, the product owners that don't have time, that don't have enough time. We gather them together in one room and we work on one machine, on one computer, on one task, on the most important task together until it's finished to deliver the feature, the valuable feature to our customer. Woody Zuel calls this all the brilliant minds working together on the same thing at the same time in the same space and at the same computer. In the current situation, it's probably not a good idea to work, work at the same computer using the same keyboard. So we have to ad adopt this uh, part, adapt this part a little bit. But let me add, uh, it can be the same virtual space and then more programming becomes remote more programming and it works really, really well. So this was a short overview of what we're gonna see today. Let's have a look at the agenda for today. I think I will talk about 50 minutes um, about more programming and remote more programming and we can have a Q&A session afterwards. So please, if you have any questions, type them in the chat. Marcos will be monitoring the chat and I will see it afterwards and I can answer your questions um, after my presentation. Um, what's our agenda for this evening? First, I'd like to ask you some question, how your team is currently working and if that's a problem. And you can think about that uh, when I show it to you in a, in a second. Then I'll, um, I'll give you an overview of uh, mob programming and remote mob programming is usually working. I say usually because there's no best practices. Uh, mob programming is an idea of how to truly work together. So you have to experiment with it. You have to find your own best practices. But I can show you some good ideas if you have never heard of mob programming, how you can start and uh, what helped other teams to get started with more programming. And the final part will be, why does it work? Why does it help us working together? And why does it help us to build teams and to keep teams stay together? But let's start with how your team's working or how it might be working. And when I come to a team for coaching, I have a look if this team is really one team. Are you one team when you're working? For example, with five developers, are you one team of five developers? Yeah, for sure, you might say. But um, maybe you're rather several teams, like five teams of one. So you're five developers, but every developer is working on his or her separate task. You're working in parallel. That might not be a team, one team of five, but five teams of one, and you have to synchronize later on. That's really costly. And it becomes more problematic if um, not all of you are uh, at the same speed. Some of you are quicker than the others. Um, some of you are slower. Some cannot start right from the beginning. They have to start later on. And some of you cannot be there all the time. Um, so maybe you're not one team working together, but more like many teams who have to synchronize uh, beyond team borders. And then we go to our boss and say, wow, this parallel working in parallel, um, the synchronized cost is too high. Let's work together, all five developers on one task. And then our boss might say, what? Five de developers for one task? Who's going to pay for this? Why should I do this? Why should I support this? Well, dear boss, what do you optimize for? Do you optimize for delivering the most important feature to our customers or do you optimize for keeping us developers as busy uh, and working to capacity as we can, like 150%? And let me give you a hint. What you optimize for is what you get. If you optimize for the first, we, you get happy customers because we can deliver the most important feature, feature, valuable feature after valuable feature to our customers. Or you have busy developers. Why busy? Why should we be busy? Well, 
let's have a look at these developers and they're busy. The first developer is busy writing a pull request. And um, while I'm writing the pull request, I got a change. I have to change my pull request, okay. So I amend my pull request um, and I get another change request, oh well. Now, next pull request, whoa, this one goes through. Three or four of my colleagues have um, have uh, acknowledged my pull request so I can merge that pull request, that feature branch into main and I get a merge conflict. Uh, deployment seems far away. Um, I have to do other things. And why are these other developers busy? Well, they're doing the reviews of my pull requests. If they're just clicking the pull request through, it's completely wasted time. But if they take their time to look at the pull request, it takes really, really long time. And then one of the developers helps me resolving the merge conflict. And when we're done, we suddenly realize that um, the new code is completely useless or doesn't solve the business problem. So we have to refactor everything and working on new features seems far away. What if we instead optimize for flow, for a flow of value delivered to our customers? So we would maximize not for being busy, but for um, delivering the number of things done, of valuable things done, and we minimize waste. That doesn't mean we don't have any waste, but maybe the time spent working in parallel and to synchronize that work takes more time than work together, working together on one thing and working on everything at the same time, coding the new feature, including the reviews of five people in the room, doing the refactorings and bug fixes and learning from each other. Then we can deploy and make our customers happy and so on. And this might cost less time than working in parallel and synchronize your separate teams. And then our boss says, but our speed, what about our velocity? If you've got a boss like this, let's go back to an old saying. Remember the old saying, if you need to be fast, if you feel you need to be fast, slow down. Because you don't want to deliver output. Of course, you will deliver some output, but that's not your main goal. Um, as uh, isn't to be busy. We're not aiming at being busy, but we want to slow down to deliver valuable outcome to our customers to lean back and see if we build the right things and if we build the things right and if uh, and to give us time to learn from each other and time to build our team. If you um, ignore all these aspects, you will have some software, but your customers will probably say, oh, that's crap. They didn't know what they were working on. Were they working on together or had they just someone throwing this over the fence, over the wall um, and um, delivering um, unreliable uh, software to our customers? Slow down doesn't mean be actually slow, but slow down just enough to take care of the important things you see in green at the bottom of the screen. Be slow enough that you don't rush and haste through your work. Yeah, you can be quick or fast, but please don't hurry. Hur don't hurry too much. Take your time to deliver valuable software. Okay. So how does mob programming and remote mob programming work? And again, please note there is no right or wrong. Um, if I show you something, it might work for you. Try it, experiment with it, adapt it to your needs. Um, it's some ideas how you might start if you've never done more programming before. So how do we start? Maybe you know pair programming. And in pair programming, we've got the notion of two roles, of a driver and of a navigator. The driver's the one at the keyboard, like uh, at the steering wheel in a car, and the navigator's having a plan, a map. And if the driver suddenly seeing a cat crossing the street, the driver will drive around that cat. But if a sign says road closed in, um, in two kilometers, the navigator can look at her plan and see um, where we could go instead to reach our destination, to reach our goal. And this, these are two valuable roles, but um, there is a, there's an important aspect what distinguishes pair programming from pair programming that actually feels good. And that's rotating these two roles. 
if I'm the driver for, for half an hour, for one hour, uh, that doesn't feel good for both of us because we might fall prey to the driver observer anti-pattern. That is, one is doing the typing and the talking for too long and the other ones can't follow the driver and just falls asleep. We call this worker and watcher. And if you ever experienced this, you know what I'm talking about. This does not feel good. The driver observer anti-pattern um, is not good. It doesn't feel good. Please rotate the roles. And this is the main reason why we have this rotation of roles, this passing of the keyboard at the main point of mob programming. If we're a team working on one computer on one task, we'll pass the keyboard um, every few minutes. And especially in the beginning, it's important to, to have a fixed time box to be remembered that you have to pass the keyboard because we easily forget about this. And this passing of the keyboard is one of the most important things uh, at uh, mob programming. If we're co-located on site, we'll do this every five to 10 minutes. This might sound crazy, but successful mob programming starts with a um, really short time box. If you're new to mob programming and you can do it on site, try it with five time box of five minutes and then pass the keyboard on to the next. Being remote requires um, a longer handover, so we'll have usually have time boxes of 10 to 15 minutes. And if that still sounds crazy to you, just try it out. That's where most of the magic uh, from mob programming happens. And since we easily forget about passing the keyboard, please use a timer. If we're on site, you can use your smartphone timer or a timer on your tablet or on a large screen. And if we're remote, um, I recommend you use one of the online web timers Personally, I prefer Cuckoo Team, the Cuckoo Team timer, but there are lots of other timers as well. And the style of passing the, the keyboard encourages another thing, um, and that's called strong style navigation. The usual navigation that we did with pair programming was, was um, I've got an idea, please give me the keyboard that I can type my ideas into code. And let me open this window and there's in the, this command on the shell and oh, what, what I want to do next? Yeah, let's type this. And, and after two minutes, you can't follow me anymore because I'm thinking about what I'm going to do. I forget about telling you what I will do. I just typing and switching windows. That's confusing for you. So Lul and Falco invented strong style navigation and it goes like this. I've got an idea, so please take the keyboard and I will explain my idea to you um, that you can type my ideas into code. So you're taking the notes, you're kind of a typist for my ideas. My ideas grow in my head and whenever you think, oh, that's stable enough, that's no more nonsense, you can type it into code. This way, we slow down just enough that you can understand what I'm trying to think and try, trying to tell you. And that's a really strong way of working together, but it's um, a style that you have to practice because for most of us, us it's um, quite unusual to work this way. But this way is default for more programming because it's so strong to listen to others speaking out their ideas and there's just someone in the room who's taking notes in code. That's really, really strong. And if you're used to strong style navigation, you can use all the brilliant minds uh, of your team and of your company. Um, you can not only do more programming with us developers, we can have the ops people join us, user experience people, um, product owners. I've had team leads and product owners saying, well, if it really works this way, I must be able to take over the keyboard because yeah, I, I dare to type uh, something into the keyboard if you tell me what to do. So if it's really working, I must be able to go to the keyboard. And those sessions were brilliant. They were mind blowing for everyone because they suddenly understood what the others were thinking, what problems they were, they were facing. And the product owners suddenly were more a part of the team and not distant or apart because they don't have, they most of the time have too little time to spend with the team. If you are a product owner or a team lead and you can spend say two hours a week to do more programming with your team, it will be a completely new experience for you and for your team. 
And the idea is, why should we gather all those people and require them to stay with us? We want to finish the most important task first, not to work in parallel as much as we can, but to get the most important thing first. How do our mob sessions usually work? What's our agenda? Um, usually we start with agreeing on some guidelines for this next session, like what time box will we use? Five minutes like last time, or let's try seven minutes or 10 minutes. Um, what, what we want to do today? What, one, what experiment do we want to start today? Do we want to have an explicit navigator even when doing mob programming? I'll tell you more on this later on and so on. What guidelines do you give yourself for this next session? Then one of us gives a short introduction to the task. A short introduction means maybe one time box, maybe two, but no more. Get started coding as soon as you can because the questions and the problems arise when you start coding and then you can answer them and can go back to explaining whenever you feel like doing this. Because then we go into rotation between discovery of the problem, planning of the next steps and implementing them. But the only thing you don't need to do is estimate your work anymore. I've seen so many useless estimating estimation meetings where we didn't have a clue what to estimate. And now with more programming, we're just discovering, uh, planning and implementing, but we don't need to estimate it because we're, we're um, using, we're working on our most important task right now. We're doing a break about once per hour. Um, your mileage may vary. Try what works best for you, but don't forget the breaks to get a fresh, fresh head, especially in these home office um, times. It's important to have at least 10 minutes of break from the screen every hour. And that's what we try to do. The duration of a mob session is uh, at least two hours. We've, we found that we want to spend at least two hours together because of all the setup time required. And then it's, it happens easily that you say, wow, that works so great. Let's spend half the day or the whole day together as a mob um, or even um, many days in sequence. But um, you can try with shorter time, uh, with shorter session durations. But I recommend you take at least two, two hours into account for your first session. And at the end, if we gather so many people together and so many people spend their time on this task, we do a short retrospective on what we just saw and what we just worked to improve our way of working together. That's a pretty uh, agile idea of uh, agile original idea of uh, continuous improvement. Yeah, that's a very lean idea, actually. And these short retrospectives are about five minutes to 10 minutes, no longer, no more hour long retrospectives every two weeks, but we do really short retros and we call them mini retros. And um, when we can do them on site on a flip chart, we just have these three areas like start, keep and stop. Uh, we just gather for five minutes our ideas. What was good today? What do we want to keep for the next session? Um, like five minutes time box. Um, what do we want to start? During our sessions, we uh, get some ideas for sure what, we, what we'd like to experiment next time. Like uh, don't have every developer uh, a keyboard each, but let's have one coding station in the middle of the room or something the like. And maybe you'll find some things you don't want to have, don't want, don't want to do anymore that you want to stop, like having a bad internet connection. And when you're working in your home office uh, remotely together, you can do this on your online whiteboard, like uh, this Miro template uh, that I'm using for my remote mob programming sessions. But it's a short retrospective. And please, if you're new to this, new to retrospectives, please focus on keep and start. Woody calls this turn up the good, focus on the good things because our brain likes good things and it amplifies the good things. So focus on keep and start and you will find some items for the stop area. Um, and many people have problems of rewording the stop things, the negative things into good things like starting, like stop having a bad internet connection. We can reword it as uh, start using a better internet connection or start preparing 
and checking for better internet connections before the session. So we can rework this and turn up the good. And this way you will improve your way of working together from session to session with really short retrospectives. If it's a retrospective at the end of the day, you should write a concise check-in for the next day. Where did we, did we stop today? What would be the next steps? Um, where do we start tomorrow morning? That we don't have to start from scratch again because we tend to forget uh, about night what we did last afternoon. So write a concise check-in, um, a letter to yourself, how, you, how to get started next morning. Helpful for our mob sessions is to note down anything, any insights we find during our mob sessions. Some ideas, some shortcuts. You'll see a screenshot of a large monitor here where we put on some stickies of syntax elements from, I think it was Python. Um, and please use all media that you can find, flip charts, whiteboard, um, sticky notes, anything that you find useful. And um, during home office times, of course, please use an online whiteboard. It helps you working together. Um, please don't use only your coding tool, your IDE. Please use something to visualize your ideas, to, to move around some texts, um, lose, use some, something like an online whiteboard. How does our setup look like for our mob sessions? And I took this from the mob programming guidebook I showed you at the beginning. Um, you want to have a look at this for sure. Um, we have a large screen in front of us, um, maybe two. We've got anything to write on, like this whiteboard or flip chart. And we've got the driver, or we call her the typist, uh, who's just taking notes in code at the coding station. There is one laptop or PC. And maybe we have an explicit navigator. If the mob gets too large and what the mob is talking about and saying that might be too confusing for the driver or the typist. So you might use an explicit navigator role who, who's navigating uh, the typist. And the rest of the mob is just uh, thinking aloud, but not steering, not navigating um, the typist. I found that with um, smaller mobs of three to five people, it might be easier to start without an explicit navigator role. And only if you find that that's too confusing for the typist, then um, start, start using an explicit navigator. Um, do an experiment with it. The rest of the mob um, is sitting there thinking, the rest of the mob is doing the programming. The typist is just doing the typing. The rest of the mob is doing all the programming, the thinking aloud. That's where the software is developed, not where the code is typed, but where, where you think about what to type. And that's the rest of the mob. And the rest of the mob can maybe do some research, research on their own device, um, but code commits only happen at the coding station, at the driver's seat. That's really, really important that during your mob sessions, there's nothing magical that appears from somewhere, but that everything that we push to our repos happens at the driver's seat. In the beginning, it's helpful to, ha to have a session host, a facilitator who helps you to um, take track of the time, who reminds you of switching roles and see how you communicate and to give you feedback on your communication. Later on, you probably won't need a host or facilitator anymore, but in the beginning, it's better to start with a host um, to get into this rotation of switching roles. So this worked really, really great. And then came Corona. And it wasn't a good idea anymore to work together in one room. But many of us suddenly thought, why can't we do mob programming um, remote, online? It should be possible. After all, we just have our computers, we have our uh, IDE. It should be possible to do remote mob programming. And fortunate for us, a bunch of people, a team at InnoQ um, was experimenting with remote pro uh, mob programming, not, not experimenting only, they were working in remote mob programming style for years. And already one year before the pandemic, they had published their experiments, uh, their experiences, their ideas on the website remotemobprogramming.org. And there they share valuable insights and ideas um, 
go there after the session, uh, have a look at that uh, website. It's really concise and an easy read. Um, you can even download a free ebook uh, from there. And they give you really good ideas how to get started with remote mob programming. Remote mob programming is different to distributed teams. And there's a fundamental difference. There is a remote manifesto developed by, I think it was GitLab. And they said, we prefer asynchronous communication over synchronous communication because we want to work at different time zones. So we cannot see each other at the same time. That's true. And that might be the case for some teams. But the remote mob programming people say, no, we're still working at the same time like we did when working mob programming style, because we think this is the better compromise for us working roughly at the same time zone, working together at the same time instead of working asynchronously. There are use cases for both ideas, but the remote mob programming people value the same time more than asynchronous communication. And if we're working at the same time, we want to see each other. And that's one basic thing to stay together at a team. We must, yeah, we really must see each other to get an idea if the other one's following me. And now I just can imagine that you're listening to me, but I cannot see you. That's really a pity. And if we're coding together, I must see your faces if you're turning your eyes or if you're giving a thumbs up or anything like this, we must see each other. And of course, the typist will do some screen sharing. And which tool you're using doesn't really matter. Um, all of them are working. Experiment with them. Take your tool of choice and it will be OK. But there's one thing to remember. If one of your team is remote, please everybody be remote. And that's important for the time after the pandemic. Uh, we've had the poll at the beginning and most of you work remote uh, these days. But after the pandemic, we'll, we'll go back to our offices at least uh, some time, uh, some of our working time. But if one of you is remote, please everybody be remote uh, because of an um, information symmetry. If only one is remote and the rest of us is sitting in one room, we have an information asymmetry and the one remote will be left behind. So one remote, please, everybody remote. And then we can code together. And the remote mob programming people developed a tool for Git handover. That is, um, the typist does some typing and when the typist finished his or her time box, um, she will push all the changes to a temporary Git branch where the next typist can check out uh, the changes and can just um, start where the, where the other uh, typist, the previous typist um, just left. And they developed a tool they call just mob. You can find the installation instructions on mob.sh and it's really simple to use uh, at the command line. You just say mob start, then a temporary branch is created in your current branch. Um, you're using your typing during your time box. Then you say mob next, everything is pushed to the temporary branch. The next uh, typist, takes, uh, typist takes over with mob start and so on. And once you've finished one task, um, one of the typists at the keyboard says mob done. And then all the temporary commits are squashed into one and you can give it a meaningful commit message. And that's pushed to the original branch. And this is really, really simple because it's just a wrapper around Git commands, but a really easy to use wrapper. So give it a try. I like it a lot. And most of the teams I showed mob, uh, this mob tool um, use it today. You'll find as well an IntelliJ plugin. Um, give it a try. Um, I like the command line tool better, but uh, that's a personal choice. There's another possibility. You can share your IDE. I like Visual Studio Code with Live Share or IntelliJ with a Code with Me plugin. That is, uh, one session host shares his or her uh, IDE. And we can work together on that code base. We can connect to that code base and type in that code base and see the changes uh, distributed to everyone connected to that host session. And that's, it, that looks really, really promising. And there are other players like Code Together, Cloud9, the AWS online editor, or the online Eclipse, uh, Gitportea, 
new players like GitDuck uh, or Git Live as well, give it a try. Um, they look promising. Personally, I prefer the mock tool on the command line because I can work with my IDE, with my installation, with all the tools. And these plugins aren't uh, as far developed that you can use all the tools uh, distributed. Um, so I like the mob tool still best at the moment, but these IDE sharings look really promising. Another possibility is to set up a centralized team VM with one team IDE. So you don't have to hand over your work in progress, but you hand over the connection, the typist connection to that virtual machine. You'll find the links, go give it a try, whichever work with our coding together tool you like best. And then software development is so much more than just coding. It's about visualizing ideas of planning, of building an architecture, and we can't do without planning. We shouldn't plan too much upfront, but we have to do some planning. And you need some whiteboard. And I mentioned already um, Miro or Mural. There are other free, um, free tools like diagrams or Excalidraw where you can draw and in real time, all the others of your team see what you're drawing, what you're typing. Please use one of those tools complementing your coding because visualizing what you're doing is part of software development as well. And then you need to take, uh, then you need to keep track of time because we tend to forget when to switch and how much time we've spent um, on our current time box. You can do it with whatever, whatever tool you like, but I found the online web timer really, really helpful. I mentioned some of them like mob time or cuckoo team. Uh, give them a try. You can just create those timer URLs and share those URLs in your team chat. This way, each of your team members can display the timer on his or her second screen or on the tablet and every one of you sees that timer running. You don't need to share it somewhere on the screen. You can use the whole screen for coding or for um, using it for developing your diagrams and you have the timer running separately and the timer goes off on each machine. So someone will, will notice that, that you have to switch the time box. And another interesting aspect, how do I find my next mob session? If we're on site, I can walk across the large floor and see who's working on what. Maybe you're working at a team where you have some smaller mobs or just some pairs working on something. And when you return from a meeting or from the lunch break, you wonder where can I join? Where can I, can I learn something or where can I support? And that's pretty difficult uh, in these home office times. But I've had several customers who just set up um, you see Microsoft Teams here, and they have a channel where we have simultaneous video conversations. So in this channel, we see all the mob sessions and the pairing sessions that are going on with a JIRA task attached to it, with a um, cuckoo timer um, that we have created. And this way I can easily see who's working on what and where can I support best or work, where can I learn most um, the most interesting thing for me or the most useful thing for me, which mob, which pair should I join? And I've seen developers starting um, such a video conversation in the morning on their own, if they're working on their own so that the first one uh, can join them and build a pair, the next one can join so there will be a mob. And that's really useful in these home office times to find each other, to see what you're working on as a maybe larger team who can um, who can have several mobs or several pairs working at the same time. And I mentioned um, pair programming already because whether you're working remote or co-located, we found out there will be mobs of two, like a pair of people working together. And we noticed that your pair programming will get better if you practice working mob programming style. And if you tried pair programming and it didn't work out and you said, no, pair programming, uh, we don't like it, please give mob programming a try. Because if you get used to switching roles regularly and doing strong style navigation, even your pair programming will be better afterwards and you won't be afraid anymore to work together um, in, in a mob of two. Why is that so? 
Pair programming and mob programming have different dynamics, like Ellen Holop says. Um, pair programming is like going on a date, and it must match one-on-one. -on -one. And if it doesn't match, it's really stressful for both, both of us. Mob programming is more like having dinner with friends. It's easier. It's more relaxed. And if I have a bad day, the rest of the team will cheer me up. So we can, uh, can work on great things together. Even if I'm not in the lead today, the others can take me with them and together we'll uh, make great software. And this is the difference between being driver in pair programming and being typist in mob programming. Being driver in pair programming can be really stressful, especially if there's a too large gap in our knowledge and skills. Um, the one with her knowledge and skills gets nervous because the other, the other one doesn't understand. It can be really stressful. And then when, mob pro when doing mob programming, you can relax while being typist. You can wait, lean back, let all the navigators do the thinking. And when they're finished, they're thinking and they're speaking out loud and you see that their ideas are stable enough. You just keep the minutes in code. You just type something and it can really be relaxing. This way, you can do all kinds of work, like mob testing. I won't go into details here. You'll find um, lots of talks about mob testing on the web, but you can do various kinds of work, mob style, and it's give it a try. It's really amazing what suddenly feels a lot better than before if you have this rotation of roles and um, the time boxes. So why is it so useful? Why does remote more programming work. And now we're at the third uh, part of this talk. Let's have a look at the um, ideas behind more programming or the way our brain works, the way we as human beings interact in our teams. Why does more programming work? Why does remote more programming work? When working in remote mob programming style, we have this cloud between us and this screen between us that separates us, but it doesn't need to be a separation between us um, because we can still do the rotation. We can still use our time boxes. And so this way we can work together. Are you working together if you're in your office? Because, um, Working together is not a question of working remote or working on site. And the question is, and I asked you this question at the beginning of my talk, um, are you really one team or are you just sitting behind your large screens, hiding behind your screens so that no one can see you and you're working separate from each other? So are you really one team? Or are you rather many teams of one? It's easy to be separated to just sit side by side, to work on different tasks and uh, to have to synchronize all this work later on. And we call this late integration. Working with pull requests is pretty late integration because you work in parallel and then you have to integrate late in the game. And you see late in the game if what you did was right or fits together. And we can do the easiest possible integration by coding together. So. Are you working as one team or are you separated? And maybe in home office, it gets worse because we've got this cloudy thing between us and it's easier to completely separate from each other. Um, maybe you've got some colleagues who switch off the camera so that you don't see them. Um, do you know what our colleague from Hamburg is doing? No, I haven't seen him for a week. So you have a don't have a clue what they are doing. They join for the uh, for the stand up um, meeting in the morning, but you only hear them. Maybe that, or, or you just see that they've joined, but you neither hear nor see them. So it's easy. It's more easy to be separated when working um, remote, when working in the home office. But um, and and this way, you never will become one team, or even your your uh, functional your team that was there before dissolves because suddenly there, there are these walls between you, these virtual walls. But being remote isn't actually the problem. Um, On-site presence is not required for building a team. There has been some research on it and they found out um, 
that we don't need on-site presence. What we need instead is common values and trust in each other. And that's the base that we can use to work on as a team. And we build common values and we build trust by seeing each other regularly. And we can do this being remote as well by switching on our cameras whenever we can. This way we can see each other, get a better idea of my colleagues, how they feel, what they think about my, um, my ideas, and we can become a team, we can stay a team. Why is it a problem uh, to build common values, to build trust? Uh, seeing each other regularly is a rather technical question or a question of commitment to turn on the camera. Um, but why is it a problem to build common values and to build trust? Maybe you know the, uh, the stages of group development or the team phases. Um, Bruce Tuckman developed them in the 1960s. And he says that every team has to go through all the phases, through all of these stages to become a team, to grow as a team. You cannot avoid one of the phases. You, you as a team must go all through these stages. The first stage is forming. You have to gather together as, as a group of people and then you will uh, do some storming. You will challenge each, each other. Um, what can the other one do? Is he better than me? Uh, am I better than him? Um, you do some, some storming. And then you'll see, okay, that's the front end boy, that's the back end girl. Okay, um, now where's my place? And then you do the norming. The norming is about finding your place, finding common ground, common values for your team. Coding standards are part of that. And only when you finish the forming, storming and norming, then you go into performing, then you will be a performing team. But let me iterate, you cannot skip one of the phases. As a team, you have to go through all of these phases. And in storming, it's critical that all the conflicts that you have, they need to be addressed. You, they need to be spoken out so you can talk about them, you can challenge them, you can find compromises, you can find ideas what you have to, um, what you do, what to do in the norming. You need to address your conflicts. And the problem is that this is often avoided by people. We're human beings. We don't like conflicts. We don't like to be criticized. And so we avoid our conflicts. But if we avoid our conflicts, we, we won't do the storming. Uh, so we actually, we can't become a team. And in the end, you can't avoid these conflicts. They will surface. They will come to the surface, um, not only um, uh, not, not only during the storming phase, but if you don't do the storming phase, maybe these conflicts arise after you've uh, released a pretty bu buggy version of your software uh, where all the customers complain about and it crashes all the time and then the finger pointing starts and then these conflicts will surface and they will be really hurtful. These conflicts will really hurt them. So um, you need to do the storming, you need to address your conflicts. If you don't do this, it's easy that the storming gets longer and longer and it prevents you from going into norming so you can't be a performing team after all. And worst of all, if one team member changes, one leaves the team, one joins the team, it's a change and you will have to start from scratch again, start with a new forming because every change in your team structure will change the team. You have a a new team and you will have to start again uh, doing the forming and the storming and new conflicts that might arise. So an idea might be to have stable teams. Um, sounds reasonable, but teams are immutable. And what might sound good at first, um, the problem is change happens, but teams are immutable. As I told you, once you, ch once you change anything, one leaves or joins the, the team, you've got a new team. Um, so stable teams are an illusion because change happens. There will be vacation of someone. So you have a new constellation. Someone will be ill sometime um, and you have new colleagues or old colleagues leaving. So change happens. So have you, new, you have a new team with forming and storming only that you're not prepared for change. 
if you think if you're optimized for stable teams. Mob programming says, well, change happens, so uh, let's embrace change. And when rotating, switching through our roles, we're going through these phases, through these team stages quicker. Um, and the phases get shorter and shorter because we experience them regularly, more and more often. We don't avoid change, we embrace change and we go through all of these phases and we are not afraid anymore of the storming. We know it's necessary. So change is a usual part of our work. Um, and when you do more programming, it's a lot easier to, to cope with change because it's a usual part of your work uh, and nothing to be scared of. So we could optimize for easy change, not resistance to change. Um, we, we don't want to avoid change, but we want resilience to change. We want to be resilient to change. And that's what mob programming can help us to do. That's why mob programming helps us to stay a team because we will have changes as a team. But with mob programming, we experience all the changes, all the stages of um, group development ever and ever again. So it's nothing, else, no, nothing scary anymore. Resilience to change means we can support each other. We can support each other if someone um, isn't there and I have to know what he or she did and I have to support his work or her work. And usually we're doing this by sharing knowledge um, that we know what the others did and that, and that I can support them when they're on vacation, for example. And usually we're doing this by documentation, yeah? writing hundreds and hundreds of pages of documentation. And we're doing this afterwards, of course, um, or we're using uh, formats like show and tell. You probably know this. Um, one developer or a few developers uh, found a pretty cool solution, implemented a feature, and then show the code of this feature to the other developers. They go through their code, they show their code, they talk about their code. Um, but sharing knowledge this way afterwards is amazingly difficult um, because um, the others don't experience what you experience during finding the solution. This is maybe some form of collaboration, but not true collaboration. What we need in more programming offers co-authoring co -authoring or co-creation. That is, we don't share the knowledge afterwards by endless documentation. We, do, we only have documentation uh, as an overview of our architecture, for example, but then we build the knowledge and experience together. Everything that you usually would have to show and tell, we experience this together right from the start. This way we can support each other perfectly. We won't be specialists in everything, but we dare to support one other, if they're just if they're just away and there's a bug that has to be fixed, I dare to fix this bug because I was there when we created the code together. Why is this working with mob programming? Mob programming is making all the implicit, the tacit knowledge and our skills visible. Um, and the implicit, the tacit knowledge is the knowledge and especially the skills that we um, that we can't document, that we have a hard time documenting. And with mob programming, um, I can watch others thinking. I can watch others, what they're saying aloud, what they're thinking. So I can see how others, maybe more experienced developers, would solve the problem. Um, I can experience how they work together, and then I can do it my, uh, myself. If I'm the typist, I can let myself be guided by the others who know so much more than me. I just have to type the code. And if I don't understand a shortcut or anything else, I'll ask them and they'll guide me. And next time, I try to navigate them, the experienced developers. And I can try if I understood the problem so I can guide them. And if I see that I can't guide them yet, there are others to support me. And one really strong fact about this um, talk, speaking out loud is, um, you probably know this, you're sitting there and, and, and you think, oh, I don't understand what they're talking about. But uh, I don't know how to ask a question either. I don't know what question to ask. And 
if you're working as a mob, someone else is there who can ask that question for you. And suddenly you see, yeah, that's the question I would have liked to ask. And next time you ask the question and, and help all the others in the mob. And that's a really strong, strong way of working together. This strong style navigation, this speaking out loud, this doing the thinking aloud and letting someone else just doing the typing, but not do the programming just the typing. And let me emphasize this. It's about knowledge and skills. It's not enough to have the knowledge. We must know how to apply that knowledge, the know-how, the skills. And this is often the more difficult part of team collaboration. The same skills or similar skills. And I can only learn by experience. And in more programming, you can learn from each other. Why is this important? with our current problems. Um, this sharing the skills, this experiencing the skills helps us to tackle complexity because our current problems are getting more and more complex, like um, another cloud solution, multi-cloud solutions, and so on. They're pretty complex. And if you've got a lot of complex tasks to work on, you have to comprehend the path to the, to the solution. It's often not enough to just see the result because you have so many questions. Why did you choose this and not that? Couldn't we have taken this approach? Wouldn't have that worked out better? If you tried this out, out together, you comprehend the path to the final solution and you can commit to that solution and you can support each other, do bug fixing on this. It's not enough to just see the result like why you chose this architecture, or oh, why some code is not there. Maybe it was there, but it was deleted because it didn't work out. And why mob programming helps to tackle complexity, we'll see if we have a look at the Carnevin framework. Maybe you know this, it's a framework developed by Dave Snowden uh, many years ago, and it uh, sorts the, our problems into different categories. And the obvious and the complicated categories, um, you can have checklists because um, the, the main aspect of Carnevin is if you know um, what category your problem falls into, you know what kind of work you need to solve that problem. Different categories need different kinds of work. And in the obvious or complicated category, we can use checklists. In the obvious uh, area, it's maybe it's obvious you don't even need checklists. But in the complicated area, um, you might need checklists like if this happens, do this. If this happens, do that. Problem is we're often in the complex uh, category. And in the complex category, we can understand cause and effect. That is, we change something and we cannot predict what will happen. We can only understand the effect of the changes in retrospect. And this can be too complex for one brain alone. So while in the obvious and complicated areas, we can work alone if you really want to, in the complex category, we should probably work as a team on our problems to understand the solution together because it's too complex for one head alone. But more programming can help us in all these categories. Um, it depends on what, uh, what problem or what, um, what, what you want to do with working together. We can work, we can learn together for sure. Um, we can be productive together, just solve task by task, and we can explore new things together. Like we actually don't know how to use it. We don't know what technology, the right technology is. We can explore it together. So you can use more programming for the different team phases, like um, let's learn together, let's build the team, and you can use it for different problem categories. For example, short-term learning together, I can pass on my knowledge and my skills or uh, gain knowledge and skills from others. Being productive together might mean uh, developing maintainable code and having a collective code ownership for the product we, we develop. And exploring together will probably change your culture of working together. And if you're doing this on a larger scale, maybe even your the culture of your company. Um, and these stages are not, necess not, not necessarily linear or sequential. Um, you can use it. Um, you can use each stage whenever you feel like. Just 
fitting to your team phase and to your problem category. So this hopefully sounds great. And if that's so great, should we do 100% more programming? Maybe. There are teams around the world who are doing 100% more programming. That's definitely possible, but not necessary. You can use it as a tool. I have teams who do more programming once or twice a week, and that helps them a lot. Other teams do more programming on a daily basis, and others do it all around the clock. So you can use whatever fits best for your team, for your tasks that you have to solve. But what you can do is to give 100% for the most important task. But not everybody has to join all of his or her time, because you can use a dynamic mob with coming and going whenever it feels right. Like um, I have to go for a meeting, so I leave the mob, but there will be enough developers to work on the task. And when I finished my meeting, I can join the mob, watch for a few minutes what they're doing, and then I can become typist and let me guide. And I'll pretty soon understand what they did in the hour I wasn't there. So you can use dynamic mobs and have 100% have, have continuous work on your most important task, but not everybody has to be there all the time. This is a really strong way of solving your most important tasks. And it helps you to start together because what we usually try to do is to, to split up our work and to work in parallel as soon as we can. And then we find that it's pretty difficult to get back together and to see if all the pieces fit together and to understand what the others were doing. It's probably better to start together, um, to start exploring coding a little bit together that everyone gets an idea of what you're doing, what the task is all about. Then you can split up, go to your meeting, work in pairs, and then it's easier a lot to come back together because you will understand what, ha what has happened in the meantime because you know where you started. So if you want to work in parallel, try at least to start together. It will help you coming back together and reintegrate your ideas and your code. And this way of working helps you with team decisions that are pretty difficult when working on site and can be even more difficult when working remote. And the idea of mob programming is if you've got more than one idea, well, try them all. And chances are high that trying all these ideas will save you time compared to endless discussions and not finding the perfect solution either. So let's say our team has three ideas and we try the first idea together. That doesn't mean we'll code it to perfection, but just enough that we get an idea of that of that if that idea will work out and that one won't work out. So we throw it away. Let's try our second idea idea. This one works out. So if we are running out of time, uh, we have a working solution that we can deliver to our customers. And if we've get, got some time left, we can try this uh, third idea. This one doesn't work out either, or it's not as good as the second solution. So we found the second solution, but we as a team commit to the second solution because we all experienced why we chose this idea, why we implemented this idea. And I do this do and decide instead of discussing and deferring the uh, decision endlessly. We do something just enough that we know that we understand the problem better and then we can decide which of our, our ideas we'll um, spend more time on. And that's the main difference between <laughs> meetings and more programming. Meetings is often about talking and talking and talking. And I promise you, I'll finish talking in very few minutes. Um, but mob programming yields working, hopefully tested and shared code in the end. And that feels good. It makes our customers happy because we can deliver something, working software to them. And that's making us developers happy because we have delivered something, something working. And it encourages us, it motivates us to develop even better software next time. And if you need some more, uh, one more motivational slide, there's the old proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. You might be faster if you go alone in the beginning, but if you want to develop a software um, 
medium term together as a team and maintain that software, it might be better if you go together. And more programming and remote more programming help us a lot here of becoming a team and of staying a team. Whether you do it 100% or not, it's a pretty useful tool, a pretty useful practice. So go and give it a try. And I'll bet most of you will like it. So where do we go from here? You might want to go to the Mob Mentality Show. Um, that's a YouTube channel maintained by um, some of the uh, inventors of Mob Programming, and they've got uh, pretty many episodes and um, quite a lot of episodes about Mob Programming. So go there uh, on their YouTube channel. Um, all those episodes are published as podcasts as well, if you like hearing more than watching them. And if you want to know how, uh, where the place of mob programming is in modern agile software development, you might want to have a look at modern agile as well. That's an idea how modern agile working software development should look like. Um, and mob programming is just part of this. And they publish some cheat sheets and one about mob programming as well. So head over to their website and have a look there. And if you're capable of reading German, in the upcoming issue number 421 of the Java magazine, I've written uh, quite a lot of pages about modern agile. So maybe you want to have a look there too. And while we're at the uh, ad, advert section, um, we're at the Java user group. So it's I think it's OK if I mention the uh, Java Land conference. It's an online event this year. But there will be community activities. And there will be some more programming dojos. We will, will be, I think, four um, facilitators and we'll um, moderate some more programming dojos. Currently, it's planned to do them in German, but I think if there's enough request, we might do one of the sessions in English. So have a look there and maybe see you at Java Land. Now, um, hopefully, you, hopefully you have any questions, um, but let me stop the screen sharing and say, Thanks for listening. And now let's have um, some questions, a Q&A session, and I'll stay, um, I'll stay uh, here afterwards so we can have a chat at the, I think it was a coffee table. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. It was a really interesting talk of you. And uh, you mentioned already the Java land. And uh, I want to add that if you are a member of the Java user group, you can get a 30% discount on attending the Java Land. So if you are a member and uh, don't have the code, please contact us and save some money. <laughs> okay, so, but of course, we have some questions. Uh, they are very active in writing questions today. Mm -hmm. And the uh, question with the most votes is from Andreas. He wants to know how to handle with team members that are impatient. Yeah, um, probably most of us have uh, with the impatient developers, the ones in mind that are that I'd like to call 10 times developers, the ones that say, oh, working with professionals one time, um, all the ones that are really capable of doing great things and they, they tend to get impatient or nervous pretty soon. But um, the, um, the, the, um, beginners, the newcomers might become impatient as well because they don't understand what's going on and they think, what am I doing here if I don't understand anything? So how to handle this? And this actually is the role of the facilitator of the session host because um, this um, imp uh, you, you have to set it up as a game. Um, and the, our first goal is not to produce a lot of output our, our goal is not to solve the task, at least not in the first sessions, but to find together in this mob working style. And once this is clear that this is just kind of a game to learn how to work together, you take a lot of stress out of it. Because we um, we um, envision uh, that our goal is to, to, to solve the task as quick as we can. And that puts a lot of stress on us. And if we say no, uh, we've built a safe room just to learn how to work together. Um, our, our goal is not to solve the task. If we do this, that's fine. But our main goal um, 
is to learn how to work together. You take a lot of stress out of this. And then you learn how to work together. You learn how to work mob style. And you'll find that you're suddenly solving the tasks that you're, you're taking. So um, set it up as a game at first. Have a session host that can take, can take care of the communication. And if you um, take care of switching those roles and take care of uh, those time boxes, um, it won't feel as bad as you might imagine. Impatience isn't a problem. What will happen? On your first sessions, you will notice that um, many of your team members don't have a working setup. Yeah, why? They are three months in our team. They don't have a working setup. How can they work with us? So um, the first thing we do in the first sessions is to set up each member's computer until it works. And you might think this is wasted time. It is not because you can see what you expect, to have, what setup you expect on each computer. And even the professionals, the ones that have working setups suddenly realize, oh, this is too complicated. What, we have a password in, in clear text. We shouldn't have, shouldn't have that. You get lots of ideas about your setup, what you should improve. So that's valuable to not um, rush too, too fast through the work, but to take your time and um, find together as a team with a working setup for everyone. And that really feels great after some, some rounds, after some rotations. Thank you. And the next question is from uh, Philippe. He wants to know, how do I ensure that discussions don't go overboard? Five Fs, five opinions. Um, yeah. Write them down, write, write your opinions down. If you just talk, you talk and talk and talk endlessly. So if white. you write them down, for example, on Miro, um, you see them and suddenly you see, oh, the, the, the fourth opinion can't work because we tried last week and we know that it doesn't work. So the fourth one, good idea, but we know that it doesn't work in our system uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, so if you see them, um, the discussion becomes focused on on um, on the written down ideas, and then um, make sure that you go into coding pretty soon. Don't talk about those ideas which might be best for ours. Write them down, prioritize them in which order you want to try them, and then try them all. Maybe maybe it was answered by my by one of the later slides. Um, try them one by one. And suddenly you see, oh, that's working. And then one of the developers says, oh, my opinion was nearly the same. So let's skip this. We have a working solution. That's fine. So work on them, visualize them, and work on them as soon as you can. And um, I've had a team um, who visualized. Uh, I, I got the idea from, from, a, from, a, uh, from a company where I didn't uh, work. And they told me about this. And I tried this with, with one team. And it was really great to have uh, like a um, like a graph um, above and below zero. Coding is above zero each time box, and just talking is below zero each time box. And you see, if you stay below zero, you should do some coding um, to have it roughly equal. This is a great visualization for this problem. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from Thomas. He wants to know, from experience, I can say that not all developers can handle agile and self-organizing teams. I imagine, imagine that with mob programming, there are even more personalities who simply don't cope with this kind of collaboration. Can you say something about what personal traits are a hindrance to doing this on a team? And how do you deal when it... Uh, when some colleagues want to prevent mob programming? Mm -hmm. Long question. I'd, yeah, uh, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to, uh, I would investigate why they would uh, want to prevent mob programming. There might be certain fears behind this. So I would uh, try to find out, and this might be the role of the coach, of the host, of the facilitator, to find out why they want to prevent mob programming. But first of all, mob, pro mob programming, um, is mentioned with modern agile, but you don't need agile uh, agile methods for mob programming to work. I've used mob programming in companies who weren't agile at all, because you suddenly get a um, grassroots movement um, 
because you start being agile at the team, even if the team don't has a notion about what agility or agile is. So you can use more programming, even if your company or your team is not agile. Um, and I've seen it working with all different kinds of personalities. Uh, there will be the ones who are impatient and the ones who don't dare to work with others because they say, oh, the others are so good and I, I don't know what to do. I'm the, the small developer who doesn't know anything. Um, so set it up as a game, get a coach, um, mustn't, uh, needn't be an external coach. It can be someone, someone from your company who encourages all to be patient and to dare joining the mob. And even the uh, introverts, introverted people, once they find that it's uh, not so scary to go to the keyboard because the others have to talk and find a solution. I just have to type their solution into code. Um, mob programming can be really appealing even to introverted people because they have to stay on the keyboard for only five minutes. And once they realize this, I can be part of the team. If I go to the keyboard for five minutes, that's uh, brilliant for them because they're not separate anymore because they're, 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 they're introverted. Um, more of a problem might be the 10 times developer who are not patient enough, but as a coach, I should be able uh, to talk to them and to explain them what benefits the team has if they take their time. Um, but that would be a team where I wouldn't do more programming 100%. Maybe once a week, maybe twice a week. Thank you. And uh, now a question from Loris. Mm -hmm. Upper management think about mob as a quite inefficient technique. How do you handle this? Uh, ask upper management why they're doing meetings. Must be pretty ineff uh, inefficient to work uh, to sit with ten or twenty people in a room and just talk. Why do have Why do they have meetings with more than one? And you have to talk um, about the same topic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but then it's not one meeting, but, but it's ten meetings of one, yeah, or twenty meetings of one. So um, we can ask them the same question. No. Um, they like the um, upper management likes rational behind uh, those decisions and ask them um, what what lead time you have in in, in your in your companies um, and lead time is an idea from from uh, lean product development that is how long does it take for an idea to go into production or to to go into to reach our customer so if we've got the product department who has an idea and to who uh, gives us a story or an epic uh, a story or a task and we start developing this, how long does it actually take until this feature is delivered to our customers? This is this is uh, this we call the lead time, not just the cycle time for our development when it's when we finished as developers, but the complete lead time from idea to customer. How long does it take? Let them measure this time. They are the upper management. They must have a means to measure this time not to get an estimate from us, but to measure this time. And it's pretty, uh, the chances are high that when working in parallel, your lead time is worse than when working together. Just measure it, measure it. do mm -hmm. some experiments with it. And um, working in parallel isn't necessarily better. It's just what um, books say for decades now, work in parallel, split up the work, but it doesn't work for complex problems. This working in parallel works well for, you know, the Carnevin framework works well for the obvious or the complicated uh, category, but no more for the uh, complicated or the, uh, for, for the complex or the chaotic category. So uh, if upper management says work in parallel, they're thinking in old terms, they're thinking in problems that are in the wrong category. Our problems are often complex and that needs a different kind of work. Let them uh, let them learn about Carnevin. Great. Thank you very much. And um, next question from Emmanuel. How to do mob programming with software developers with quite different knowledge and different working speeds? For example, how to solve the problem that developers with less knowledge as well as slower ones are left behind, leading to the driver observer anti pattern you mentioned? Yeah. If the team um, isn't capable of doing this alone, get a session host, get a facilitator that takes care 
that not the one at the keyboard is the one doing the software development, doing the um, thinking, mm -hmm. but that the rest of the mob is doing the thinking and speaking aloud because this happens if the one at the keyboard runs away. We call it a runaway driver um, because the one at the keyboard is doing the typing and nobody's understanding what he or she is doing. And if you've got a session host, um, the session host can say, oh, stop doing this. Let's do strong style navigation. And then this won't happen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the next one, we have two questions left. Mm -hmm. Again from Emmanuel. Can mob programming be used for the introduction of new employees too? Uh, of course, that's great uh, for onboarding of new colleagues. Um, actually, um, I've got a customer and they say, if you're a new colleague, you have to do production code from your first day because you, you work mob style with the rest of the team or maybe in a pair, but you don't work alone. You work together with the others and please work on production code from day one. And that's really great to um, introduce new employees to your services, to your technology, to, to your tasks, um, to your uh, product um, that you're developing. It's better than to uh, give them hundreds of pages of documentation and say, see you in three months. Uh, and when you read all those pages, come back and uh, I have to tell you anyway. So um, do this from the first day and they will thank you because they can be part of the team from the first day. That's really, really great technique. Thank you very much for your answer. And we got a new question, so we still have two left. Um, <laughs> great, great I question. Yeah, I hope I pronounce it correctly, uh, Timute. Um, is here a recommended group size or a maximum? Well, um, do some experiments with it. I'd recommend uh, having a group size of four to six to start with, because you can do smaller rotations, smaller time boxes, and it feels better if you have smaller time boxes. Um, so a group of four to six developers is best to start with, maybe four, four to five only. If you've got less developers, you um, can easily fall into groupthink. That is, you think that you have the same ideas or everyone agrees to, um, to the opinion leader, but you need a dissenting option. Dissenting options are valuable and you're more likely to, to get dissenting options if your mob size is at least four or five. Um, but then um, if the mob size um, um, grows beyond seven developers, um, you, won't, um, you won't have time on the keyboard enough. Um, your rotation will, will be too slow, so that doesn't feel good anymore. Mm -hmm. We have done more programming with 12 people, with a team of 12 people, just to share the knowledge on one finished task. And we wrote some tests uh, for, for this afterwards. And we had the whole team in one room and we had five minutes time boxes. That worked out pretty well, but I wouldn't start with it uh, with, with his size. Yeah, perfect. And uh, the last question is from Laurin. He's asking, when starting with mock programming, how do you find good and worthy tasks? Yeah. Um, really good question, because if you choose the wrong task, it doesn't feel good and you might uh, might drop more programming, although it's a useful practice. Um, try to find a task from the complicated category. Where are enough if then else uh, that you have to keep in mind? Um, make it not too easy from the obvious category. Um, if it's a task you can solve in five minutes, uh, you won't have too many rotations. And don't make it too exploratory. That is, uh, don't use it from the, um, probably not from the complex um, mm -hmm. category, because uh, you have to do a research together. And doing research together can feel awkward. You have to dare Googling together or binging together. Do you, do you say binging? Yeah. Uh, um, you, ha you have to do, uh, it, it might feel strange Googling together, but that's valuable. And this exploring things together makes you a really, really strong team, but I wouldn't start with this. So try to find a problem from the complicated category. Um, you will probably have enough of them uh, in your backlog, like set up a new service. This might be easy for one of your developers, but uh, 
uh, difficult for the rest of the team. So that's a perfect task where one or two have an idea how to solve this and the rest uh, would like to know, but two of the team can guide the rest. That would be great. Perfect. Thank you very much. That's uh, all with the questions. Thank so you. let's go on. If anyone wants to talk to Thomas or just have a discussion, uh, we soon start in uh, meeting at Wonder. But let's uh, finish this up first. So um, very important, we have more events coming on. You can find them on our website, uh, jack.ch. Uh, there are still four new events where you can uh, register already. More are in the pipeline. Then we want you. So if you are interested in doing a talk at the Java user group and get some of this really awesome, nice, custom branded Java user group uh, Swiss knives, uh, please talk to us and uh, we will see what we can do for you. Of course, Thomas will get one too. And maybe some Swiss chocolate and uh, well, let's see. And uh, we have a YouTube channel. Maybe a lot of you already know that. Please subscribe us, click on the bell to get some notifications and we will publish our talks as soon as possible on YouTube. We have a Slack community. So uh, just go to slack.chat.ch and uh, be a part of it where we can just talk. You can create own channels if you want for your open source projects, discuss your problems, whatever. You are welcome for free. And yeah, that's it so far. Thank you very much to all of you and especially to Thomas for preparing this awesome talk with us and uh, uh, changing uh, uh, his knowledge. And uh, now invite uh, I invite you all to meet at Mondami. It's a very nice platform uh, and you are invited to activate your mic, activate your camera and uh, Thomas will be there, I will be there and Let's have some nice discussions at wanda.jack.ch. See you soon. Stay healthy. Thank you and see you. Bye. Bye-bye.